Johnson had lived his mouse's existence for weeks, scurrying around the fridge of life, trying to keep from the deadly eyes of them. Edgeworks Entertainment presents... Short Transmissions. Stories to rocket you into space. space, 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 space Tonight, night, night. the tunnel under the world. Part 2 by Frederick Pohl. Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, January 1955. Source, Gutenberg.org. On the morning of June 16th, Guy Burkhart woke up in a cramped position, huddled under the hole of the boat in his basement, and raced upstairs to find it was June 15th. The first thing he had done was to make a frantic, hasty inspection of the boat hole, the faked cellar floor, the imitation stone. They were all as he'd remembered them, all completely unbelievable. The kitchen was its placid, unexciting self. The electric clock was purring soberly around the dial. Almost six o'clock, it said. His wife would be waking at any moment. Burkhardt flung open the door and stared out into the quiet street. The morning paper was tossed carelessly against the steps, and as he retrieved it, he noticed that this was the 15th day of June. But that was impossible. Yesterday was the 15th of June. It was not a date one would forget. It, it was quarterly tax return day. He went back into the hall and picked up the telephone. He dialed for weather information and got a well-modulated chant. And cooler some showers. Barometric pressure, 30.04, rising. United States Weather Bureau forecast for June 15th. Warm and sunny with a high around... He hung the phone up. June 15th. Holy heaven, Burkhardt said prayerfully. Things were very odd indeed. He heard the ring of his wife's alarm and bounded up the stairs. Mary Burkhardt was sitting upright in bed with the terrified, uncomprehending stare of someone just waking out of a nightmare. <gasps> she gasped as her husband came in the room. Darling, I, I had just the most terrible dream. It was an explosion and... Again? Burkhardt asked, not very sympathetically. Mary, something's funny. I knew there was something wrong all day yesterday and... He went on to tell her about the copper box that was the cellar and the odd mock-up someone had made of his boat. Mary looked astonished, and then alarmed, and then placatory and uneasy. She said, Dear, are you sure? Because I was cleaning that old trunk out just last week, and I didn't notice anything. Positive, said Burkhart. I dragged it over to the wall to step on it to put a new fuse in after we blew the lights out, and... After we what? Mary was looking more than merrily alarmed. After we blew the lights out, you know, when the switch at the head of the stairs stuck, I went down to the cellar and... Mary sat up in bed. Guy, the switch didn't stick. I turned out the lights myself last night. Burkhart glared at his wife. Now I know you didn't. Come here and take a look. He stalked out to the landing and dramatically pointed to the bad switch, the one that he had unscrewed and left hanging the night before. Only it wasn't. It was as it had always been. Unbelieving, Burkhart pressed it and the lights sprang up in both halls. Mary, looking pale and worried, left him to go down to the kitchen and start breakfast. Burkhart stood staring at the switch for a long time. His mental processes were gone beyond the point of disbelief and shock. They simply were not functioning. He shaved and dressed and ate his breakfast in a state of numb introspection. Mary didn't disturb him. She was apprehensive and soothing. She kissed him goodbye as he hurried out to the bus without another word. Miss Mitkin at the reception desk greeted him with a yawn. Oh, morning, she said drowsily. Mr. Barth won't be in today. <sighs> Burkhart started to say something, but checked himself. She would not know that Barth hadn't been in yesterday, either, because she was tearing a June 14th pad off her calendar to make way for the new, quote-unquote, June 15th sheet. He staggered to his own desk and stared unseeingly at the morning's mail. It had not even been opened yet, but he knew that the factory distributor's envelope contained an order for 20,000 feet of the new acoustic tile and the one from Feinbeck & Sons was a complaint. After a long while, 
he forced himself to open them. They were. By lunchtime, driven by a desperate sense of urgency, Burkhart made Miss Mitkin take her lunch hour first. The June 15th that was yesterday, he had gone first. She went, looking vaguely worried about his strained insistence, but it made no difference to Burkhart's mood. The phone rang, and Burkhart picked it up abstractly. Contro Chemicals, downtown, Burkhart speaking. The voice said, This is Swanson, and stopped. Burkhart waited expectantly, but that was all. He said, Hello? Again the pause. Then Swanson asked in sad resignation, Still nothing, eh? Nothing what? Swanson, is there something you want? You came up to me yesterday and went through this routine. You... The voice crackled. Burkhart, oh my good heavens, you remember. Stay right there, I'll be down in half an hour. W what's this all about? Tell you about it when I see you. Don't say any more over the phone. Somebody may be listening. Just wait there. Say, uh, hold on a, a minute, will, will you be alone in the office? Uh, well, no, Miss Mitkin will probably... Hell, look, Burkhart, where do you eat lunch? Is it a good and noisy... Why, I suppose so. The Crystal Cafe. It's just about a block. I know where it is. Meet you in half an hour. And the receiver clicked. The Crystal Cafe was no longer painted red, but the temperature was still up. And they had added piped-in music interspersed with commercials. The advertisements were for Frosty Flip. Marlin cigarettes. They're sanitized, the announcer purred, and something called Choco Bite candy bars that Burkhart couldn't remember ever hearing of before. But he heard more about them quickly enough. While he was waiting for Swanson to show up, a girl in the cellophone skirt of a nightclub cigarette vendor came through the restaurant with a tray of tiny scarlet wrapped candies. Choco Bites are tangy, she was murmuring as she came close to his table. Choco bites are tangier than tangy. Burkhart, intent on watching for the strange little man who had phoned him, paid little attention. But as she scattered a handful of the confections over the table next to his, smiling at the occupants, he caught a glimpse of her and turned to stare. Why, Miss Horn, he said. The girl dropped her tray of candies. Burkhart rose, concerned over the girl. Is something wrong? But she fled. The manager of the restaurant was staring suspiciously at Burkhart, who sank back in his seat and tried to look inconspicuous. He hadn't insulted the girl. Maybe she was just very strictly reared young lady, he thought, in spite of the long bare legs under the cellophane skirt. And when he tried to address her, she thought he was scary. Ridiculous idea. Burkhart scowled uneasily and picked up his menu. Burkhart! Burkhart! It was a shrill whisper. Burkhart looked over the top of his menu, startled. In the seat across from him, the little man named Swanson was sitting tensely poised. Burkhart! The little man whispered again. Let's get out of here. They're on to you now. If you want to stay alive, come on. There was no arguing with the man. Burkhart gave the hovering manager a sick, apologetic smile, and he just followed Swanson out. The little man seemed to know where he was going in the street. He clutched Burkhart by the elbow and hurried him off down the block. Did you see her? He demanded. That horn woman in the phone booth? She'll have them here in five minutes, believe me, so, so hurry up. Although the street was full of people and cars, nobody was paying any attention to Burkhart and Swanson. The air had a nip in it, more like October than June, Burkhart thought in spite of the weather bureau. And he felt like a fool following this mad little man down the street, running away from some them toward, toward what? The little man might be crazy, but he was afraid, and the fear was infectious. In here, panted the little man. It was another restaurant, more of a bar, really, and a sort of second-rate place that Burkhardt had never patronized. Right straight through. Swanson whispered, and Burkhart, like a biddable boy, sidestepped through the mass of tables to the far end of the restaurant. It was L-shaped with a front on two streets, at right angles to each other. They came out on the side street, and Swanson, staring coldly back at the question-looking cashier, and crossed to the opposite side of the sidewalk. They were under the marquee of a movie theater. Swanson's expression began to relax. Lassum, he crowed softly. <laughs> we're almost there. 
he stepped up to the window and bought two tickets. Burkhart trailed him into the theater. It was a weekday matinee, and the place was almost empty. From the screen came sounds of gunfire and horses' hooves. A solitary usher, leaning against a bright brass rail, looked briefly at them and went back to staring boredly at the picture as Swanson led Burkhart down a flight of carpeted marble steps. They were in the lounge, and it was empty. There was a door for men and one for ladies, and there was a third marked manager in gold letters. Swanson listened at the door and then gently opened it and peered inside. Okay, he said, gesturing. Burkhardt followed him through an empty office to another door, a closet, probably, because it was unmarked. But it was no closet. Swanson opened it warily, looked inside, and then motioned Burkhardt to follow. It was a tunnel, metal walled, brightly lit, empty. It stretched vacantly away in both directions from them. Burkhardt looked, wondering around. One thing he knew, and knew full well. No such tunnel belonged in Tylerton. There was a room off the tunnel with chairs and a desk and what looked like television screens. Swanson slumped in a chair, panting. <sighs> We're all right for a while here, he wheezed. They don't come here much anymore, and if they do, well, we'll, we'll hear them and we can hide. Who? demanded Burkhardt. The little man said, Martians! His voice cracked on the word and the life seemed to go out of him. In morose tones, he went on, well, I, I think they're Martians, although you, you could be right, you know. I, I've had plenty of time to think think things over the last few weeks after they got you. It, it's possible they're Russians, after all, but still, I, start from the beginning. Who got me when? Swanson sighed. So we have to go through the whole thing again. All right, all right. Um, it was about two months ago that you banged on my door late at night. You were all beat up. Scared, silly. You begged me to help you. I did? Naturally, you don't remember any of this. Listen, you'll understand. You were talking a blue streak about being captured and threatened and your wife being dead and coming back to life and all kinds of mixed up nonsense. I thought you were crazy. But, well, I've always had a lot of respect for you and you begged me to hide you and I have this dark room, you know. It locks from the inside only, but I put the lock on myself. So we went in there just to humor you, and along about midnight, which was only 15 or 20 minutes after, we passed out. Passed out? Swanson nodded. Both of us. It was like being hit with a sandbag. Look, I, didn't that happen to you again last night? I guess it did, Burkhart shook his head uncertainly. Well, sure. And then all of a sudden, we were awake again, and you said you were going to show me something funny, and we went out and bought a paper, and the date on it was June 15th. June 15th? But that's today. I, I mean, you got it, friend. It's always today. It took time to penetrate. Burkhart said wonderingly, You've hidden out in the dark room for how many weeks? How can I tell? Four, five, maybe? I, I lost count. And every day the same. Always the 15th of June. Always my landlady, Mrs. Kiefer, sweeping the front steps. Always the same headline in the papers at the corner. It gets monotonous, friend. It really does. It was Burkhart's idea, and Swanson despised it. But he went along. He was the type who always went along. It's dangerous, he grumbled worriedly. Suppose somebody comes by, they'll spot us, and... What have we got to lose? Swanson shrugged. It, it's dangerous, he said again, but he went along. Burkhardt's idea was very simple. He was sure of only one thing. The tunnel went somewhere. Martians or the like, fantastic plot or crazy hallucination, whatever was wrong with Tylerton had an explanation, and the place to look for it was at the end of the tunnel. They jogged along. It was more than a mile before they began to see an end. They were in luck. At least no one came through the tunnel to spot them. But Swanson had said that it was only at a certain hours that the tunnel seemed to be in use. Always the 15th of June. Why? Burkhart asked himself. Never mind the how. Why? 
and falling asleep completely involuntary, I mean everyone at the same time, it seemed never remembering anything. Swanson had said how eagerly he saw Burkhardt again, the morning after Burkhardt had incautiously waited five minutes too many before retreating into the dark room. When Swanson had come to, Burkhardt was gone. Swanson had seen him in the street that afternoon, but Burkhardt had remembered nothing. And Swanson had lived his mouse's existence for weeks, hiding in the woodwork at night, stealing out by day to search for Burkhardt and pitiful hope, scurrying around the fridge of life, trying to keep from the deadly eyes of them. One of them was the girl named April Horn. It was by seeing her walk carelessly into a telephone booth and never come out that Swanson had found the tunnel. Another was the man at the cigar stand in Burkhardt's office building. There were more, at least a dozen that Swanson knew of or suspected. They were easy enough to spot once you knew where to look, for they alone in Tylerton changed their roles from day to day. Burkhart was on the 851 bus every morning of every day that was June 15th, never different by a hair or a moment. But April Horn was sometimes gaudy in the cellophane skirt, giving away candy or cigarettes, sometimes plainly dressed, sometimes not seen by Swanson at all. Martians? Ghosts? Whatever they were, what could they be hoping to gain from this mad masquerade? Burkhart didn't know the answer, but perhaps it lay beyond the door at the end of the tunnel. They listened carefully and heard distant sounds that could not quite be made out, but nothing that seemed dangerous. They slipped through. And through a wide chamber and up a flight of steps, they found they were in what Burkhart recognized as the Contro Chemicals plant. Nobody was in sight. By itself, that was not so very odd. The automatized factory had never had very many persons in it. But Burkhart remembered from his single visit, the endless, ceaseless busyness of the plant, the valves that opened and closed, the vats that emptied themselves and filled themselves and stirred and cooked and chemically tasted the bubbling liquids they held inside themselves. The plant was never populated, but it was never still. Only, now it was still. Except for the distant sounds, there was no breath of life in it. The captive electronic minds were sending out no commands. The coils and relays were at rest. Burkhart said, Come on. Swanson reluctantly followed him through the tangled aisles of stainless steel columns and tanks. They walked as though they were in the presence of the dead. In a way, they were. For what were the automatons that once had run the factory, if not corpses? The machines were controlled by computers that were really not computers at all, but the electronic analogs of living brains. And if they were turned off, were they not dead? For each had once been a human mind. Take a master petroleum chemist, infinitely skilled in the separation of crude oil into its fractions. Strap him down, probe into his brain with searching electronic needles. The machine scans the patterns of the mind, translates what it sees into charts and sine waves. Impress these same waves on a robot computer and you have your chemist, or a thousand copies of your chemist, if you wish, with all of his knowledge and skill and no human limitations at all. Put a dozen copies of him into a plant and they will run it all, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, never tiring, never overlooking anything never forgetting. Swanson stepped up closer to Burkhart. I'm, I'm scared, he said. They were across the room now and the sounds were louder. They were not machine sounds, but voices. Burkhart moved cautiously up to a door and dared to peer around it. It was a smaller room lined with television screens. Each one, a dozen or more, at least with a man or woman sitting before it, staring into the screen and dictating notes into a recorder. The viewers dialed from scene to scene, and no two screens ever showed the same picture. The pictures seemed to have little in common. One was a store where a girl dressed like April Horn was demonstrating home freezers. One was a series of shots of kitchens. Burkhart caught a glimpse of what looked like the cigar stand in his office building. It was baffling, and Burkhart would have loved to stand there and puzzle it out, but it was too busy a place. 
There was the chance that someone would look their way or walk out and find them. They found another room. This one was empty. It was an office, large and sumptuous. It had a desk littered with papers. Burkhart stared at them briefly at first, and then as the words on one of them caught his attention with incredulous fascination. He snatched up the topmost sheet, scanned it, and another, while Swanson was frenziedly searching through the drawers. Burkhart swore unbelievingly and dropped the papers to the desk. Swanson, hardly noticing, yelped with delight. Look! He dragged a gun from the desk. And it's loaded, too! Burkhart stared at him blankly, trying to assimilate what he had read. Then, as he realized what Swanson had said, Burkhart's eyes sparked. Good man, he cried. We'll take it. We're getting out of here with that gun, Swanson, and we're going to the police. Not the cops of Tylerton, but the FBI. M maybe. T just take a look at this. The sheaf he handed Swanson was headed. Test Area Progress Report. Subject, Marlin Cigarettes Campaign. It was mostly tabulated figures that made little sense to Burkhardt and Swanson, but at the end was a summary and that said, Although Test 47, K3, polled nearly double the numbers of new users of any of the other tests conducted, it probably cannot be used in the field because of local sound truck control ordinances. The tests in the 47, K12 group were second best, and our recommendation is that retests be conducted in this appeal, testing each of the three best campaigns with and without the addition of sampling techniques. An alternative suggestion might be to proceed directly with a top appeal in the K-12 series, if the client is unwilling to go to the expense of additional tests. All of these forecast expectations have an 80% probability of being within one half of 1% of results forecast and more than 99% probability of coming within 5%. Swanson looked up from the paper into Burkhardt's eyes. I don't get it, he complained. Burkhardt said, I don't blame you. It's crazy, but it fits the facts, Swanson. It, it, just, it just fits the facts. They aren't ghosts or whatever. They aren't Martians. These people are advertising men. Somehow, heaven knows how they did it, they've taken Tylerton over. They've got us, all of us, and you and me and 20 or 30,000 other people right under their thumbs. Maybe they hypnotize us, and maybe it's something else, but however they do it, what happens is that they let us live a day at a time. They pour advertising into us the whole damn day long, and at the end of the day, they see what happened. And then they wash the day out of our minds and start again the next day with different advertising. Swanson's jaw was hanging. He managed to close it and swallow. Nuts, he said flatly. Burkhart shook his head. Sure, it sounds crazy, but this whole thing is crazy. How else would you explain it? You can't deny that most of Tylerton lives the same day over and over again. You've seen it. And that's the crazy part, and we have to admit that that's true, unless we are the crazy ones. And, I mean, once you admit that somebody somehow knows how to accomplish that, the rest of it all makes kind of sense. Think of it, Swanson. They test every last detail before they spend a nickel on advertising. Do you have any idea what that means? Lord knows how much money is involved, but I know for a fact that some companies spent 20 or 30 million dollars a year on advertising. Multiply it, say, by a hundred companies. Say that every one of them learns how to cut its advertising cost by only 10%, and then that's, that's peanuts. Believe me, if they know in advance what's going to work, they can cut their costs in half. Maybe to less than half, I don't know, but that's saving two or three hundred million dollars a year. And if they pay only ten or twenty percent of that for the use of Tylerton, it's still dirt cheap for them and a fortune for whoever took over Tylerton. Swanson licked his lips. You mean, he offered hesitantly, that we're a, well, a kind of a captive audience, Burkhart frowned. Not exactly, he thought for a minute. You know how a doctor tests something like penicillin? He sets up a series of little colonies of germs on a gelatin discs, and he tries the stuff on one after another, changing it a little each time. Well, that's us. We're the germs, Swanson. 
only it's even more efficient than that. They don't have to test more than one colony because they can use it over and over again. It was too hard for Swanson to take in. He only said, well, what do we do about it? We go to the police. They can't use us as human guinea pigs. Well, how do we get to the police? Burkhart hesitated. I think, he began slowly, sure, this place is the office of somebody important. We've got a gun. We'll stay right here until he comes along, and he'll get us out of here. Simple and direct. Swanson subsided and found a place to sit against the wall out of the side of the door. Burkhart took a position behind the door itself and waited. The wait was not as long as it might have been. Half an hour, perhaps. Then Burkhart heard approaching voices and had time for a swift whisper to Swanson before he flattened himself against the wall. It was a man's voice and a girl's. The man was saying, Reason why you couldn't report on the phone? You're running your whole day's test. What the devil's the matter with you, Janet? I'm sorry, Mr. Dorkin, she said in a sweet, clear tone. I thought it was important. The man grumbled. Important? One lousy unit out of 21,000. But it's the Burkhart one, Mr. Dorkin, again, and the way he got out of sight, he must have had some help. All right. All right. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter, Janet. The Chaco Bite program is ahead of schedule anyhow. As long as you're this far, come on in the office and make out your worksheet. And don't worry about the Burkhart business. He's probably just wandering around. We'll pick him up tonight and... They were inside the door. Burkhart kicked it shut and pointed the gun. That's what you think he said triumphantly. It was worth the terrified hours, the bewildering sense of insanity, the confusion and fear. It was the most satisfying sensation Burkhardt had ever felt in his life. The expression on the man's face was one he had read about but never actually seen. Dorkin's mouth fell open and his eyes went wide, and though he managed to make a sound that might have been a question, it was not in words. The girl was almost as surprised and Burkhart, looking at her, knew why her voice had been so familiar. The girl was the one who had introduced herself to him as April Horn. Dorkin recovered himself quickly. Is this the one? he asked sharply. The girl said, yes. Dorkin nodded. I take it back. You were right. Um, you, Burkhart, uh, what do you want? Swanson piped up. Watch him. He might have another gun. Search him, then, said Burkhart. Uh, I'll tell you what we want, Dorkin. We want you to come along with us to the FBI and explain to them how you can get away with kidnapping 20,000 people. Kidnapping? <laughs> Dorkin snorted. That's ridiculous, man. Put that gun away. You can't get away with this. Burkhart hefted the gun grimly. I think I can. Dorkin looked furious and sick, but oddly not afraid. Damn it, he started to bellow, and closed his mouth and swallowed. Listen, he said persuasively, you're making a big mistake. I haven't kidnapped anybody, believe me. I don't believe you, said Burkhardt bluntly. Why should I? But it's true. Take my word for it. Burkhardt shook his head. The FBI can take your word if they like, but we'll find out. Now how do we get out of here? Dorkin opened his mouth to argue. Burkhardt blazed. Don't get in my way. I'm willing to kill you if I have to. Don't you understand that? I've gone through two days of hell, and every second of it I blame on you. Kill you? It would be a pleasure, and I don't have a thing in the world to lose. Get us out of here. Dorkin's face went suddenly opaque. He seemed about to move, but the blonde girl he'd called Janet slipped between him and the gun. Please, she begged Burkhart. You don't understand. You mustn't shoot. Get out of my way. But, Mr. Burkhart... She never finished. Durkin, his face unreadable, headed for the door. Burkhardt had been pushed one degree too far. He swung the gun, bellowing, and the girl called out sharply. He pulled the trigger, closing on him with pity and pleading in her eyes. She came again between the gun and the man. Burkhardt aimed low, instinctively, to cripple, not to kill. But this aim was no good. The pistol bullet caught her in the pit of the stomach. Dorkin was out and away, the door slamming behind him, his footsteps racing into the distance. Burkhart hurled the gun across the room and jumped to the girl. Swanson was moaning. Nah, that finishes us, Burkhart. Oh, why did you have to do it? We could have got away. We could have gone to the police. We're practically out of here. We... Burkhart wasn't listening. 
He was kneeling beside the girl. She lay flat on her back, arms held her skelter. There was no blood, hardly any sign of the wound, but the position in which she lay was one that no living human being could have held. Yet she wasn't dead, and Burkhart, frozen beside her, thought, she isn't alive either. There is no pulse, but there was a rhythmic ticking out of the outstretched fingers of one hand. There was no sound of breathing, but there was a hissing, sizzling noise. The eyes were open, and they were looking at Burkhart. There was neither fear nor pain in them, only a pity deeper than the pit. She said through her lips that withered erratically. Don't worry, Mr. Burkhart. I'm all right. Burkhart rocked back on his haunches. Staring where they should have been blood, there was a clean break of a substance that was not flesh, and a curl of thin golden copper wire. Burkhart moistened his lips. You're a robot, he said. The girl tried to nod. The twitching lips said, I am, and so are you. Short Transmissions was created by Heather Johnson Yu, produced and edited by Rachel Emerson, music by Molly Walburn, brought to you by Edgeworks Nebula. Tune in next week for the next episode of short, short, short transmissions. transmissions. Edgeworks Nebula.